Christmas. You know, it's interesting at this time of year, we kind of throw that word around a lot. And, you know, sometimes uh, there are those that are just merry, right? They, they don't know why we're even celebrating. They don't understand that Christ is the center of all of this. And it's just merry. They want to exchange gifts and want to have a good time. And then there's others, maybe you're in this room, it's just Christmas, there's no Mary. You know, we're kind of like the Scrooge, you know. And we forget the joy of the Lord is our strength. We can get so beat down by the world, can't we? Difficulties in life, fractured relationships, misspoken words. And before long, we can begin to wear the hurt and the pain in this world. Hurt people, hurt people. And this world is broken and it is fallen. But in Christ, it is Mary Christmas. The joy with the reason for the joy that we have. Christmas is filled with, filled with unexpected surprises, isn't it? Some of my favorite are in the movies. National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. And, and in the movie, one of my favorite scenes, it takes you off guard the first time that you see it. They're gathered around the dinner table. And everything, it's, and it looks like a Norman Rockwell painting. And they're gathered there, and they ask Grandma to say grace. And it's like, grace has been dead for 30 years or whatever, you know. And, and her husband, you know, say the blessing, you know, and trying to help her out, I'm sure. And what does she do? She bows her head, and they all prepare to say grace. And she stands up and leads them in the Pledge of Allegiance, you know. And Cousin Eddie, he stands up first. And, and then, well, Clark, he's the last one reluctantly. He gets up and he joins in. But it just catches you off guard, you know. And it's just kind of a funny moment in the scene. Well, let me tell you, something's been catching me off guard this month. Every time I've been getting in my car, the radio has just spontaneously began playing songs I've never heard saying words that I should never say. And it's DJ Stokey. I don't even know who that is. I don't know how I got it. I don't know how I got on my phone. Or Saki. I've never heard of that group or person either. And they are saying things that I should never say. They are saying things I should never hear, you know. And I'm thinking, man, what what is going on with my phone and my car? And and surprisingly and embarrassingly Several times over the last month, I get in the car with another staff member, and these songs start, and I'm frantically trying to hit buttons and distract them. Because, you know, if you're like me, I get in somebody's car, and whenever music starts playing, it tells me something about them. So I'm thinking, our staff, my staff's thinking, I'm listening to Saki and, you know, DJ Stokey and all these people. And then other people get in my car, and I'm like, oh my goodness, this has got to stop, you know. What's happened? And yesterday, I drive to Kroger. And I listened to it a little bit longer than I normally do or should. And again, I've never heard these songs before in my life. And all of a sudden it says, brought to you by Apple CarPlay. And I thought, I'm going to get another surprise at the end of the month. I'm going to have a bill on my credit card statement. I said, I've hit a wrong button. And you know, Christmas is about surprises, isn't it? It's about unexpected things that show up. Well, that first Christmas was no different. It was unexpected, and it was a surprise. Go ahead and turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. The title, the son of Joseph. That's the title of our message here today. And we're going to see how he was surprised. Matthew tells the story of the nativity from Joseph's perspective. Luke has the longest uh, nativity narrative, and it tells the perspective from Mary's point of view and from her perspective perspective. But as we're going to see here, Matthew only uses eight verses. Matthew only gives us eight verses to tell of the miraculous event of the conception and birth of Jesus. The angel of the Lord in the first two chapters of Matthew comes to Matthew at least three times. We're going to read that the first time he, he tells him to take Mary as his wife. Then he tells them to leave Egypt. Angel comes back to him again in Egypt and says, okay, it's time to go back home. And there might have been a fourth time an angel comes to Joseph because we learn also an angel told him 
that when you go back to Israel, don't go back to Bethlehem. Even though Herod is dead, go back to Nazareth. So an angel either spoke to him a fourth time or on one of the other occasions he gave him that bit of information as well. But Joseph doesn't say a word. Nowhere in the Bible is a word from Joseph recorded. The angels speak, the shepherds speak, the wise men speak, but Joseph doesn't speak. Yet his actions we hear loud and clear. Now, could it be that Joseph's words are not recorded because they want to keep the focus on Jesus? I mean, that could be a possibility. Or could it be, just practically speaking, that Joseph had already passed away by the time the disciples, the writers of our New Testament, came onto the scene? So they didn't have opportunity to talk to him or interview him. It's hard to say. But what we do know is that he and Mary had a great marriage. But all accounts we see, they had several children. They, they had multiple children. They had several girls and several boys. One of Jesus' half-brothers grows up, and he ends up being the leader of the first church. And we know him as James, not James the disciple, but James the brother of Jesus who would later be called camel knees, that he prayed so fervently, it is said that his knees became like callous. We understand that Joseph taught Jesus the family craft. He became a carpenter. We have nothing negative about Joseph. But here in these verses, we're going to learn a lot about him through his actions. Beginning in verse 18 of chapter 1 of Matthew's gospel. Let's begin reading. If you're there, say amen. This is how the birth of Jesus, Messiah, came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you're to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord commanded him, and he took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son and he gave him the name Jesus. So first of all, on our outline, point number one, let's look at the character of Joseph. I mean, this is a crazy scene. Talking about the surprise that must have been on his face when it was found out that Mary was pregnant. He knew he hadn't slept with her. So in his mind, the only rational thing that anybody could conclude as someone else did. And now she is pregnant. The birth of Jesus is not the subject of this narrative. In verse 18, depending on your translation, most say this is how the birth of Jesus took place. This word birth in the Greek text is the word genesis. It means or origin or beginning. In other words, Matthew is saying, this is the beginning of Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. This is how the story unfolded. In other words, he said, this isn't a delivery room. Maybe that's what we have in our mind as we talk about Joseph's perspective on the virgin birth. No, he is, this, is, this is more theological of what's happening here in the text. And Joseph and Mary have already been engaged. The word is betrothal. That's the word they would have used in their culture. And it was an engagement. It could have happened at any age. Uh, they could have been two years of age. And the dads got together and said, I like your family. You like my family. Let's go ahead and have an arranged marriage. And at that point, uh, the, the groom's parents would produce a dowry, a bride price. It was an investment. So if chance the... Uh, guy grew up and all of a sudden he didn't want to marry her 
Well, she had money. It was like restitution. It was a promise that they were going to marry, but if they didn't, then she had financial compensation. So Mary and Joseph, their engagement, their betrothal, most believe was probably around, Mary was maybe 13, 14, Joseph 19 or 20. We don't know the exact age, but that would have been fairly typical. So the betrothal was an official binding legal agreement that you were going to marry this girl. You stood before her and before a priest. All the parents were there, and you said your vows. And then the next year, you prepared for the wedding feast. But during that year, there was no sexual contact. You didn't consummate the marriage in any way. The bride would go back to her house after the betrothal, and the groom would go back to his house. And he would begin building a room on his father's house and then after a year, we go by, approximately a year, all the festivities were ready and all the food and all the relatives were going to be able to be there. They had a wedding that was like a week long. Just a, a week ago, I was a part of a wedding and they wanted some Greek Orthodox traditions in their wedding. And, and after that experience and reading more about a Greek wedding... I, Robin and I feel cheated. I kind of want to go back and do it over again. I mean, it was, it was this elaborate festival. It was, it was, it was gospel-saturated. It was Bible-saturated. There was not, nothing secular in their services. It was a ceremony. It was a worship service. And it took a lot of preparation. And after a year, you would come and you'd have this week-long celebration. You can read a little bit about it in John chapter 2, the wedding in Cana. And the celebration would end, and then the husband and wife, they'd go back to this home that the husband had built, this room onto his father's house, and they would consummate the marriage, and they would officially be husband and wife at that point. And then if anything happened in between time, if they called it off, then it would be a legal matter. You would have to go through legal proceedings. And one of the ways that you could call off a wedding if someone was unfaithful. So even though you hadn't consummated the marriage during the betrothal period, if you had sexual relations with someone else, you were considered to have had adultery. Not just fornication, but adultery. It was that serious. And the penalty in the Old Testament was stoning. So if you had committed adultery and your spouse brought you before uh, the law at the time, and you were found guilty, then you were executed. You were stoned to death. Now, as we read in Scripture, even in Numbers, uh, we see that, that marriage wasn't uh, much like our culture, maybe at some point didn't become as serious. Uh, they didn't take it as importantly. And you could divorce with two witnesses. If there was something that happened, then you could get two witnesses together, and you could annul the marriage. And what we read about Joseph here, Joseph loved Mary. He loved Mary. He was committed to her. And all of a sudden, he finds out that she's pregnant. And he knows it's not him. Now, many people would want to get vengeance in the situation. They, they, they would want everybody to know. I mean, Joseph is a righteous man, the Bible says. He would want people to know, hey, listen, it wasn't me. I didn't break the law. I didn't do anything in this situation. So, so most people would act that way, so they would be set up for the next marriage. Because who wants to marry a guy in this culture, especially in this day, that already has a child by another woman who he never did really marry? So most men wouldn't have been like Joseph. They'd have been like, I want everybody to know. I want you to know, I want you to know, I want you to know. Especially all the eligible ladies in the house, right? I want all of you to know, this wasn't me. This, she had to sleep with someone else. But the, the Bible says that he wanted to divorce her secretly because he didn't want anything to happen to her. He was less concerned about his future and more concerned about hers. The word that's used here for Joseph's character, that he was kind or righteous, depending on the translation, it is the same word that Saul used when he described David. Saul was trying to kill David. Threw spears at him. I mean, he was malicious toward David. Or, yeah, Saul was. But Saul said of David, he was a kind man. He was a righteous man. He would not take vengeance. 
This is the same word that Matthew uses for Joseph here to describe his character. Even though he had every right, even though he had to be incredibly disappointed, he had to be hurt over the situation, but yet he knew he had to keep the law. He knew that he had to follow the law and he could not marry her. So he decided to do it quietly. His character is so clear in this passage. Point number two. Then we have the charge to Joseph. An angel comes to him, and notice the title that he gives him. Son of David. Joseph, son of David. This links us back to the previous verses that we looked at last week on the genealogy. The angel is declaring to Joseph, there's something special about you. And that which is special about you is that you're in the lineage of David. And if you were here last week, or you've been in church any amount of time, you know that the Messiah was prophesied over a thousand years before Jesus came that he would come through the lineage of David. And his throne would be an everlasting throne. And so the angel shows up and says, Joseph, there's something special about you. You are in the lineage of David. It's such an an odd statement. Except for the fact that Matthew is recording it, that the angel said it, linking us to the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecy. He's also setting up Joseph for what he was going to command him to do. Notice the prohibition. Do not be afraid. I mean, I don't know about you, if an angelic being shows up, I'm going to be a little bit afraid, right? Most of the occurrences, we read about them in the Old Testament, an angel shows up, they're speechless, they fall to the ground, they can't speak. But the same thing the angel would say to Mary, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid, Joseph. I'm not here to kill you. Do not be afraid, Joseph. I know you've never seen anything like me. Or is it, do not be afraid, Joseph. Don't be afraid, Joseph, to marry Mary. Don't be afraid, Joseph, of the circumstances that are surrounding the situation. It is in the plan of God. And he is charging you with a task that is important, a task that is significant, a task where you play an incredibly important role. He tells him to take Mary home as his wife, to take her home. Everything that had been prepared, continue as planned, despite what you perceive as a hiccup, a challenge, a surprise, this is the plan. God's right on time. This isn't taking God by surprise. No, this is the plan, Joseph. It surprised you, but it didn't surprise God. Many of us today are in similar situations. There's things that are happening in our life today we didn't plan for. It's a surprise. We didn't ask for it. And we consider, God, why are you doing this? Oftentimes, we cannot see the plan of God because we're so close to it. Here, Joseph, it had to be a very difficult news to hear. And then he says, you're to name him Jesus. The Greek is literally, you will call his name Jesus. It is is unused anywhere else in the New Testament. The sentence, syntax, the order of the words, it's a throwback to the Old Testament. As soon as the Jewish reader is reading this, immediately their mind goes back to the Old Testament. Where does it go in the Old Testament? Yahshua. Jesus, in the Old Testament is the word Joshua, Joshua. Yahweh saves. You're to give him the name Yahweh saves. And and more than pointing back to Joshua, uh, the priest, during the time of Zerubbabel, more than pointing back to Joshua, who led the people into the promised land, he is pointing back to a psalm. Psalm 138, where the psalmist writes, he himself will redeem Israel from all their sins. He, Yahweh, will redeem Israel from all their sins. Jesus, Yahshua, will redeem all his people from all their sins. His name bears his mission. 
verse 23, the fulfillment of the Old Testament. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will call him Emmanuel. Joseph, you didn't father this child. And Joseph, you're not going to name this child. But this child is significant, and you play a part in this plan. And you are to name him Emmanuel. God with us. God in the flesh. God put on flesh and blood. And he came to this earth. Came into our lives. And this earth. And experienced everything that this world has. And died for each and every one of us. Jesus was born of a woman. Now you might say. Well why is that important? Why is it important that the scriptures prophesied that Jesus would be born of a virgin, and then it actually happened. Well, in Genesis chapter 3, the Bible says that the Messiah would be born of woman's seed, not a man's. You and I inherit a sin nature from our parents, they from their parents, and all the way back to Adam. That you and I have a sin nature. From the moment we are born, we are sinners, and the rest of our lives, we prove that is our nature by our actions. We have a sinful nature. When Rachel was born at Norton Community Hospital in Virginia, and we were there two days, and we looked at Rachel, we saw part of Robin in her, we saw me, one of Robin's sister-in-law says, man, she looks just like your mom, Alan. And I began to see features of her. And as Rachel grew older, and then eventually we would see the same in Noah, they began to show mannerisms of other people in our family. The way they talk, things they did, how they make decisions. Even family members, they're not around very often. You see, DNA came together and chromosomes came together by God's precious gift of life. And they became a person. But they, came, they became a person with a code written in their personality. They were born with it. And just like they were born with these chromosomes and DNA qualities that make them a person, so you and I inherit our sin nature all the way back to Adam. Jesus, if he had been born of man, the seed of Joseph, then he would have had a sinful nature. Jesus had no sinful nature. He knew no sin. That's why he was a perfect sacrifice. He was conceived of the Holy Spirit, of the seed of woman and that alone. And he was without sin, perfect. As Isaiah would say, he was the Lamb of God that was without blemish. As John would say, John the Baptist in John chapter 1, as Jesus is coming, he points to him and says, look, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. He took away our sins and only could do that because he was without sin. No sin nature whatsoever. So we have the charge of Joseph. Take him home, Joseph. You didn't, wasn't from your seed. You don't name him, but you play a part. It's going to be difficult. It's going to be a lot of rumors that would go around. Everybody's going to know about it. But this is the charge. Then finally, we see the courage of Joseph. The courage of Joseph still had a decision to make. The angel told him this, but was he going to do it? He could have said, okay, all right, it's not mine. You're saying nobody slept with her, okay, you deal with it. I'm not going to deal with it. I'm going to go on with my life. I, I mean, if this happened at this point in the marriage, what's going to come next? I mean, we're supposed to have a honeymoon period. I mean, if, if this is how it begins, this surprise, what's next? Joseph in courage stood up to all the rumors, all the talking, all the confusion. The Bible says when Joseph woke up, verse 24, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded. And he took Mary as his wife. And notice verse 25, but he did not consummate the marriage until after she gave birth. 
Matthew is dropping all throughout this first chapter. Evidence so that we know that Mary was a virgin. That she did not sleep with the man until after Jesus was born. You know, while this is a simple story here in Matthew's gospel, only eight verses, Joseph says nothing. It is significant. Joseph's obedience is no less remarkable than Mary's. So much to lose. So much confusion. And yet he adopts Jesus. And we know that because Jesus took on his name. And you and I know that this stuff, it lingers years. It, Jesus was in his 30s. And the Pharisees looked at him and throwing stones at him says, at least we're not an illegitimate child. He never shed that title. An illegitimate child child was it Joseph's was it someone else we don't know but we know it was before their wedding day the betrothal wasn't over and something happened so what do we learn about Joseph what can we take from this well as he was a man of righteousness who kept the law we should be people of righteousness that love God's word, that study God's word and live out the gospel. We should be people of righteousness. May it be said of us. What else do we learn from Joseph? He was a man of grace, compassion, mercy. We should be people of grace, compassion, and mercy. We should care less about where people have been and more about where we're going. We don't care what you've done. We care more about what Christ has done for you. And we want you to experience that. This Christmas, give somebody the gift of forgiveness. Forgive them for what they've done to you. Give somebody the gift of kindness and mercy Joseph was faithful to her, faithful to her in the midst of this craziness. Joseph said, all right, Mary, I don't understand all this. I don't know what's next, but we're in it together. Don't we all want friends like that in family, church family? I don't know how you got into this mess, but I want you to know that you're not going to go through it alone. This happened, that happened, and then there's consequences but we're not going to leave you in that. We're not going to talk behind your back or post something on social media. No, we're with you through it. Joseph was faithful. We are faithful people, even when those around us are faithless. Joseph adopted Jesus. Isn't that a beautiful story? When he, it says in the final verse of chapter 1, he gave him the name Jesus, it means that he legally adopted him. He gave him the name. I'm naming this boy. Was not my seed. Don't know what's next, but he's mine. I am legally his father. And everything I have, I'm giving to him. You know, I, I grew up in a home where I have uh, older brothers and sisters and younger brother and younger sister. But I'm the only child from my mom and dad. So my older siblings are from my mom, half brothers and sisters. My younger siblings are through my dad, half-brothers and half-sisters. But you know, we never called each other half-brother and sister. <laughs> it was always, this is my brother, this is my sister. We, we all had full rights. I saw my, my dad love uh, my older brothers and sisters, although they were not his. My mom constantly asking how my younger brother and sister were doing and trying to keep up with them. Adoption. Well, adoption isn't our idea. It's God's. That we are adopted into his family. And Joseph adopted him into his family. He taught him the family trade. 
He was known as a carpenter. None of other, none other of Jesus' family has that title. No, maybe they did. Maybe they were carpenters and it was passed down. But Jesus is explicitly given that title to show us that Joseph took him full in. Fully in. Joseph loved and led his family well. We should love and lead our family well. Eight days after his birth, he took him uh, and he had him named. He had him circumcised, keeping the law, loving him. When he was 12, Joseph took his family, took Jesus, took Mary, and they caravaned to Jerusalem. Up until the age of 12, boys and girls would always stay with their mom. The mom was taking care of them, teaching them. Uh, They might go to school or might go to that school. But at age 13, they then were handed off from their mom to their father to learn a trade. They either went to a rabbi school or they followed in their dad's footsteps. So at age 12, they would make this pilgrimage to Jerusalem, a big ceremony that's coming out when a boy became a man. And then they would begin to travel with their father. So they take him to this big festival and they're there. And then they leave. And, and they're, like, on the journey outside of Jerusalem. And like, where's Jesus? <laughs> you can understand the confusion because Joseph's like, well, I figured he was still with you. And Mary's like, no, we just had the ceremony. He's like with you. Like, you all have this argument, but in different ways, right? <laughs> all the married couples in the room are like, yeah, we've had that argument. I thought you had him. I thought you had him. <clears throat> and they search for Jesus. Three days. There's some significance there. And where do they find him in the temple? Like, Jesus, where have you been? But in my father's house, about my father's business. That would have reminded Joseph of this very night, don't you think? I've been in my father's house, about my father's business. And Joseph says, okay, I understand. Let's go. And from that point on, he trained Jesus to be a carpenter. Everywhere Joseph went, Jesus would go. This is how you carve it, Jesus. This is how you hammer it. He adopted him fully. I think we can all see that Joseph was just mirroring Jesus and the Father and how the Father is to us. The Father is righteous and holy. He keeps all the law. But he is compassionate toward you, isn't he? He's been merciful towards you. He he has been gracious toward me. He has shown me love and forgiveness, even though I mess up time and time again. Even with struggles, his love does not abandon me. John would write in 1 John that his love is so great, he lavishes upon us because we are his children. God's love is so lavish. We had our second child, Noah. David Lawrence calls, and he's giving me a word of encouragement over the phone. And he says, you know, Alan, some people say when they have more kids, like, well, who you got to give this person attention and that person attention. This child, some of your love, and this child, some of your love. He said, that's just not true. They treat it like a piece of pie. And you give one child a piece, another child a piece, and all of a sudden you're out. He said, no, Alan, you give every one of your kids your entire pie. You give them all your love. The Bible says that God is love, and he gave himself. And he says he'll never leave us nor forsake us. That's love. At your worst moment, God did not leave you. At the, at the point where you turn your back on God and the leading of the voice of the Holy Spirit, God does not leave you. No, God presses in. And as a born-again believer, you have the gift of the Holy Spirit in you. So wherever you go, God goes. His very presence is manifested in your life every day and every second of every day. God is here right now. The Holy Spirit is in this room. He's speaking to you. He's opened up your mind and your heart. He's telling you things. For some of you, God's telling you, I've not forgotten you. You've not gone too far that my love is not greater still. For some of you, God is telling you that His grace and mercy is available for you right now. For His grace is sufficient 
For his power is made perfect in your weakness. In your sin, in, in, in your backsliding, God's grace grows. It's magnified when you turn to him in repentance. See, his grace never runs out. He gives you all of his love. And God adopts us. God adopts us into his family. God doesn't have children, biological children. He has one son, and his son is God. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Three in one. You become a part of God's family through adoption. God gives you that right, that opportunity to join his family. He signs the adoption papers. And when you become a child of God, you are heir to everything. All the glory of heaven is yours. You're a child of the king. You're an heir to the throne of the living God who created the universe. The rainbows and the storms. The mountains and the seas. The beautiful sight of a baby born. All his. And he says, everything I have is yours. He loves you and he leads you. I was listening to N.T. Wright this past week, a scholar and theologian from England. And he said, I think most of the world has this entirely backwards. He says, most of the world, even a lot of Christians, actually believe believes God hates them and he calls an innocent person to die for them. That God hates you, he's trying to get you, and an innocent person dies for you. And he writes that. But the Bible says, God loves you, and he gave his one and only son. No one forced Jesus. No one coerced him. He laid down his life willingly for you. A sacrifice, a lamb to the slaughter. Who did not open his mouth? God loves you. He doesn't hate you. God is love. He hates sin. And he showed the full extent of his hatred by nailing it to a cross and the person of his son. John chapter 14, and we'll close with this. You know what a preacher, what it means when a preacher says 10 more minutes? Absolutely nothing. No, I'm just kidding. Maybe. John, it's gospel, John chapter 14. Jesus' disciples are gathered around him. He's going to the cross. They're nervous. And he says, I go to prepare a room for you. And in my Father's house are many rooms. And if it were not so, I wouldn't tell you this. In the betrothal period, the husband goes and prepares a room on his Father's house. And a year goes by preparing for that marriage supper. And then there's a great celebration. And the marriage is consummated. See, we're in the betrothal period. For those of you that are in a relationship with God, you're the bride of Christ, and He is the groom. And He has gone away to prepare a room for you. And in His Father's house are many rooms. And if just the right time, He's going to come back and take you to His home. Thomas says in John 14, but we don't know the way. And Jesus says, you know the way. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you have not come through the Father, then you are not a child of God. You know you've come through Jesus to the Father 
when there is change in your life, you're a new person. You have a love for God and people and the love for the things of God. And your spirit is quickened. Following Jesus is not a religion. It's not checking off your box that you came to church or gave a tithe or serve. No, following Jesus is a relationship. And we are eagerly awaiting his return. And he is faithful. He is coming back. And he will take all his adopted children to be with him. Are you in the family? Do you know him? If not today, it's really simple. He says, everyone who calls upon me will be saved. To repent of sins and to acknowledge that he is God. And place your faith in him. And you're married. You're betrothed. 